Good morning from WKYT News. I'm Bill Bright. We certainly hope you are enjoying your weekend and time is running out for the state legislature. Despite our state motto that is emblazoned on our state flag, it would be difficult to overemphasize just how divided things really are in Frankfurt these days. A Republican governor and a Republican Senate are often opposed by the House, where Democrats just added to their majority in special elections. In Lexington, you can literally walk down a street and have one side represented by a liberal state lawmaker and the other by a staunch conservative. This week, all of the chamber's Democrats voted for a spending plan that made changes to the governor's budget proposal, and not a single Republican voted for it. So where are we headed as Washington-style politics seems to have arrived in the Commonwealth and what laws are being passed by the General Assembly? We'll get two perspectives today. Later, Republican State Representative Stan Lee will be here. But first, Democratic Representative Kelly Flood is here. Representative Flood, welcome. Thank you for being with us today. Such a pleasure to be here. Interestingly, though you and Representative Lee are so diametrically opposed on so many issues, you have a good working relationship. Very much right? so. Mr. Lee is, uh, Representative Lee is a uh, very um, dignified man and uh, handles himself with courtesy when he engages his colleagues and over the years he and I have uh, managed from that place to find common ground and uh, we are able to have um, productive conversations with one another. And yet it is elusive these days to find that common ground in Frankfurt. How did we get to such a point of a, of a house divided? And I mean that is maybe the, the entirety of the state capital. I recognize that uh, it is difficult to name one thing that got us here, uh, but there has been an increase in language that has kept us divided. But I would want the uh, state of Kentucky to understand, uh, the people in our districts, that while the language is often quite divisive, when we're in there doing our jobs on the floor of the House and uh, in our uh, committee meetings, there is enormous regard for one another and their opinions. So the day-to-day -day workings of government still have a civility to them and an ability to get things done. It's just that the divisive language of campaigning has um, filtered all the way down into that process and can at times stymie it. It is interesting that, as we mentioned, that there are places where your districts touch, <laughs> where you, literally someone could have their foot in one district and in the other, and, uh, you know, you would be, have totally different representation in Frankfurt. That's right. Uh, it is interesting how this state... Uh, makes its political decisions, isn't it? I think Kentucky is a state that has a certain comfort level with that dichotomy. Uh, it is not entirely surprising to me. Of course, I'm thrilled with the results of the elections uh, for over a week ago now. But this is a state that historically has allowed uh, both parties to have a full existence. And I think that it is a state that demands a certain level of tension in that work to hold it all. Uh, I think we're capable of getting work done and getting a budget passed. Um, the unknown quantity at this point is the governor. So you think that uh, Kentuckians pretty much think it's okay if they, uh, you know, ha have uh, some uh, fight and scratch some up there for a few weeks, and as long as uh, we some produce a budget, done. yeah, as long as we produce a budget. Well, let's pivot to that. Uh, the only piece of legislation that is required to be passed by the legislature is that uh, budget, the state spending plan. How will we allocate more than twenty billion dollars over the next two years? The House has passed a version that differs from the governor's proposal. Uh, for one thing, it uh, takes out his proposed cuts to higher education and it does some other things. Uh, he wanted to put money into the retirement pensions and that's why he constructed the budget as he did. Your proposal also addresses that? Absolutely. The governor's proposed budget had 650 million cuts in this year alone. 47% uh, of which were in education. So when he made the statement the night that he addressed both chambers that he was holding education harmless, it simply wasn't true. What we have done is to protect all of education from Governor Bevin's proposed cuts while fully meeting the state's commitment to the public retirement systems. Uh, in this budget, we are putting forth the full actuarial, uh, the ARC, the fully required contribution by the state. And it is the first time in years that we have done that. And we're committed to moving forward by fully funding it. We also have put an additional $90 million into the state's uh, retirement system above the ARC. Uh, what we haven't done is uh, believed that a 
quote unquote permanent fund set aside of five hundred million dollars uh, makes that the governor proposed that is not make sense at all to those of us who've been in government now for uh, uh, myself for eight years others for decades five hundred million dollars parked to the side when you've got fundamental needs in the state that need to be met this is a um, what's going on in our pensions is a process that we can manage back toward health over a decade is it a result of neglect, though, over time? I would say not entirely. While the legislature certainly is responsible for not fully funding the ARC over the years, there have been reforms in the years that I've been there. Uh, we have periodically done reforms and even raised taxes to meet the needs. I see the pension issue in our entire country as a fundamental question of how much do we value state workers state government and do we believe that they ought to have pensions uh, that help sustain them in their old age democrats believe that they ought to be protected you mentioned this uh, 500 million dollars that the governor is putting in the rainy day fund he and not a rainy day fund well uh, and it matters to set it aside to set aside 500 million dollars and leave it untouched now with all due respect all of us know you're not allowed to just set money aside and say you can't touch it because that's our job is to spend the tax dollars sent to us. It's if you park that money and don't have a role for it, uh, what happens is it gets dipped into pretty quickly. But the governor indicates this is money that was uh, was found in accounts, that it was uh, unspent, that it is not necessarily recurring money. It's not something that's going to be there uh, or guaranteed to be there next time around. So if you put that into the budget to be spent, it may not be there when the time comes. It may not, but other sources could be. And here's reason why there's genuine reason to um, plan budgets like this. We saw yesterday that the stock market rose uh, 75 points. That's significant. We saw in our own state that our unemployment rate is down below uh, f two, four and a half percent. We see how our own resources. I've been in the government now for eight years, and during that time, we've cut a billion dollars from the government. There is no more waste. I mean, you could find a sliver of it, but when you cut a billion dollars, you've cut out waste. And what we have done for the first time this year is see a um, revenue increase that we have not yet spent of $300 million. That's the first time since I've been up there where there are additional resources. We're on the upswing. If you were able to hold higher education uh, harmless from the cuts that the governor is proposing, would you nevertheless tell them to be more efficient with their spending? That, of course, is a significant message. But I would say that the presidents of the university across the board are cognizant of that message. And while you can point to uh, instances where people look often see high salaries, say, in uh, uh, administrative salaries, what we also know, though, is every one of our universities is a fundamental economic hub in the region, from our own University of Kentucky to Moorhead State to um, Western to all of our universities are playing such a vital role we need to invest in them and if they have issues around streamlining that is something we can address as a legislative body but this is again a entire state that has taken a billion dollars out of our university systems included uh, over the last uh, eight budgets so it's time to begin to invest why did the the House remove from the, its spending plan, I think, about $100 million that the governor wanted for what he calls a workforce development? That is I'm a, happy to address that. That's right. actually in the area of the budget that I cover for your viewership. I am the budget subcommittee uh, chair of the K-12 through yeah. education budget. And in that is also workforce development. A hundred million dollars of bonding was set aside. That's significant money, significant uh, amount of uh, capability. And when I had Secretary Heiner uh, before me and asked for specificities on what was proposed, while there were some general statements made about building buildings for uh, tech centers where we could bring people to train them, but our uh, Kentucky college systems already do, especially our community college systems. Um, I asked for more specific details about the full bonding potential of what we were talking about and wasn't able to get anything in writing. So it really came to the point where we knew we can't approve that. We simply are not able to do that as a body. Do you think it's the administration, though, uh, trying to say that they're, uh, you know, maybe 
college isn't for everybody, that there are certification jobs that are out there that need to be filled and Kentucky needs to position itself uh, to, to get to kids ready for those. The administration is catching up to an argument that the Democrats and Republicans have been making and working on over the past 18 months. We have been developing an entire system of workforce ready um, certificate programs that we've directed the community colleges and universities to produce for us. Their work has been remarkable and a lot of what I think we could do and are prepared to do through the Democrats proposal for a uh, workforce ready process of uh, making it free to go to community college after a set of uh, standards that you meet uh, to ensure that they can get these certificates. We know that there are people who want to go get a two-year certificate and get right into the workforce. We want to make that happen. Other legislation uh, yes. that is uh, going on right now that you're, that you're watching, that you're interested in, uh, uh, charter schools, yes. uh, you, you oppose them. I uh, do not oppose them because okay. Kentucky already has them except we chose not to allow profit-making charter schools in. What we have done instead is keep them public, funded with public dollars. Uh, our own Woodson Academy locally is a fine example of what we created are districts of innovation. The biggest thing charter schools historically in other states offer is a flexibility in a lot of the administrative needs that schools have to follow uh, to, to meet standards. And that flexibility is created in what we call districts of innovation, which we have across the state. And we have numerous charter schools that are already functioning within our own local community districts, where our local school districts have the authority to make sure they keep the standards. Okay, fair to say that you want them to be <clears throat> very narrowly defined as they are at this point. What matters to me is that in our anxieties around having education gaps, that we not allow people who are intent on making a profit off of that anxiety into the state. What we can do is together in this remarkable state that has led the nation in how to reform education, continue to lead the way in how we do what I call innovative um, schooling. Representative Flood, uh, uh, as you uh, look ahead in this session, what are some things that you want to try to get done? What do you want to stop, if you can, uh, before uh, you adjourn <laughs> here in, in uh, a few days? I truly want to ensure we bring home a budget. In a budget year like it is this one, all of us agree our own personal agendas, whatever else is going on, falls by the wayside to getting this budget done. This state deserves a government that uh, responds to its needs and we get our job done in the 60 days. I believe we're well positioned. I genuinely do. I think that the Senate, while the, you saw that the Republicans voted against uh, our bill yesterday, what I also heard in the committee and on the floor was a uh, an enormous amount of regard for the work we did do. And because we emphasized education, Republicans care about it as much as Democrats do. And when you have a budget where you've emphasized something we all care about, we can get to common ground. And I believe the governor will probably see that as well. All right. Uh, thanks for coming. Thank we you appreciate so much. It. Back to work uh, over you. there in Frankfurt. And we'll be back with a Republican perspective on WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers in a moment. Welcome back in to WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers. We're glad you're with us today as we continue to discuss the 2016 Kentucky General Assembly. Of course, they are working to try to get a state budget passed in the hands of Governor Bevan and then back for final action before they recess in April. And we're joined now by Republican State Representative Stan Lee of Lexington. We mentioned earlier that you can literally walk down a street in Lexington and on one side is the district of Representative Lee, uh, who is a staunch conservative, and on the other side of the street, uh, you would see rep the uh, district represented by uh, the liberal state <coughs> representative, Kelly Flood, who was with us a little bit earlier. Uh, representative Lee, thanks for being here, and a member also of uh, House leadership on the uh, majority, uh, minority side. We appreciate you coming in. Thank you for having me. Uh, how is this session going, in your view? Well, I think the session's going very well for the voters and for the taxpayers, I think, because of the elections we had last year and uh, the, the, the decided movement. Uh, towards more conservative elected officials, uh, this this session has gone uh, much better in, in in that regard. Representative uh, Flood was talking about uh, that uh, despite very strong differences that she has with you, that you all get along just fine. 
Well, I try to get along with every <laughs> member of, of the General Assembly. It's important that we try to work together. And on areas where we can agree together, uh, agree, we do. And then uh, on other areas where we disagree, uh, we've always had, uh, uh, I would say, cordial debates on, on things. But uh, sometimes they, uh, passions do flare from time to time. But uh, she uh, represents her position well, and I try to do the same for my position. Do you think it's important that, uh, that things not flare, that things do remain uh, uh that there is decorum uh, in in the legislature, or uh, or are we headed to a time when Frankfurt looks a lot like Washington? Well, I I I, I think decorum is important. I think uh, exhibiting just basic common courtesy goes a long way. Uh, there is all I like to say. There's always a, a right way and a best way to say everything. Even if I need to tell you something that you're not going to want to hear, there's a best way to say that. And sometimes that takes a little bit more effort, but if you take that effort, I think it produces a better result. Let's talk about the uh, what happened in the legislature this week. The majority Democrats passed a, a budget uh, that they have now sent on to the Senate to, for uh, consideration over there, and we'll see how that all gets worked out. But uh, it was uh, all Democrats who voted for it. Not a single Republican voted for it, but you're not on record against it. Is that the case? Well, we didn't didn't support the Democrats' plan, and there's uh, several primary reasons for that. The first is is that when we all came in uh, to session this year, we all agreed. I think 138 members of the General Assembly agreed that the number one issue was to address the pension uh, problem, the unfunded uh, 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 liability there. And with that in mind, the governor introduced his budget, which specifically set aside money to address that and to provide more funding for the pension plans that have been done in the previous eight years. Uh, what the House Democrats uh, chose to do is rather than work towards a long-term solution, they, they, they took an approach uh, to plug the hole for just two years, spend all the money, and then uh, basically put us in a position where at the end of the fiscal 18, uh, we'll, we'll be in a position where major, major cuts will have to be made. Uh, we will not be in a position to protect uh, K through 12 education. We'll not be in a position to 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 offer any real measure of funding, <coughs> excuse me, to higher education because we spent all the money now and we've not set aside any money to address the long-term pension crisis, which is what the governor wanted to do to the tune of about a billion dollars at the end of the fiscal 18, at the end of the biennium. You've been there a long time. How did we get here with these pension uh, <coughs> problems we have? Well, you, you, you have, uh, in, in, and I will say this, over the last eight to ten years, I think I've voted against every budget, and that was one of the reasons. We, whether, whether you liked him or agreed with him or not, Senator David Williams, who was the Senate president for years, brought up this issue eight to ten years ago. And if we had just made uh, a one percent change in the contribution rate and a one percent change in the benefit rate eight years ago, we wouldn't have this problem right now. And that would have been uh, would have been easy to do, and yet people decided they didn't want to do that. Uh, the employees, uh, the employee unions, didn't want to do that. Uh, the teachers' union did not want to do that. They didn't want to consider that then. And now we're at a point where, if we don't take corrective action now, corrective action is going to be taken. At some point, it may be taken by a bankruptcy court. So you're saying, uh, and what would that look like? Uh, it's anybody's guess. Look what happened in Detroit. And there's cities out in California. I mean, if if the the uh, stakeholders want to have a say, now is the time to do it because we have a governor who was elected. Uh, he won virtually every county on the message that we have to get our fiscal house in order and that we need to set aside money. We need to budget not to zero, not to spending every dime we can get our hands on, but to budget to where we set aside money to truly deal with that issue. And by not doing that, there are other uh, ramifications. Just last week, Standards & Poor downgraded our rating again. What does that mean to the, to, to the public? It means that if we want to borrow money to build roads and bridges and what have you, it's going to cost us more money to do that. We'll have to pay higher interest rates to do that. Therefore, we won't be able to do as many projects. So there are needed projects that need to be addressed, need to be done, but not addressing the pension problem is costing us money and ultimately is going to cost 
uh, K through 12. It's going to cost all these other programs that we want to take care of. At issue, it seems to be when you when you put the budget side by side, the Republican proposal that uh, did not pass because you did not have the majority, and the Democratic. Uh, uh, bill that, that, that did pass. Uh, you see the restoration of cuts to higher education by the Democrats in their budget uh, that is uh, those cuts proposed by Governor Bevan, as well as this question of this $500 million or so that the governor has found uh, in various places around state government, but that's what you're saying is non-recurring, right? That that is just... Well, that's a non-recurring... Uh, what the House Democrats have done, they have passed a, a budget that is structurally imbalanced, out of balance to the tune of uh, half a billion dollars using what's, what we call one-time money. Rather than doing that, the governor had proposed setting that money aside in, in a permanent fund, he called it, a fund that would grow over the years to where we could address that problem, the, the unfunded pension liability. And instead of doing that, the House Democrats, and it's just, it was their philosophy, obviously, to spend every dime they could get their hand on. And at the end of the biennium, we're going to be left with no money to address future pension obligations, no money to do that whatsoever. And we're going to have the taxpayers will be backed against the wall, and they're going to come in and they're going to say the only thing we can do is raise taxes. And I have two problems with, with, with doing that. Number one, I think the taxpayers spoke pretty loudly last election when they elected Governor Bevin. And number two, well, revenues are actually up about $270 million this year over last year. So we're taking more tax dollars from the, reven uh, from the taxpayers this year than we did last year. It, it, it's a cliche now, but it's true. We, we, we are not taxed too little. We're spending too much. And this governor and House Republicans chose to uh, propose budgets that would get out of control spending under control for the first time and to stop all this mindless uh, borrowing that's been going on. Another difference is that uh, the proposal from Governor Bevan was for about $100 million for uh, workforce development uh, programs. And Representative Flood and the, uh, was saying that the Democrats took that out because it was unclear uh, how that money was going to be spent. I think the governor's office is still working on the parameters of how they wanted to do that. Uh, the, the, when the governor proposed his budget, as you may recall, he had met with numerous business leaders and one of the, I guess probably the primary com uh, complaint or concern they had was not having qualified workers. And by that, uh, they meant workers to do specific types of jobs, specific types of trades that quite frankly aren't being filled right now by people going in traditional college and university classes. Uh, he was talking about working hand in hand with, with private industry to do that. And they were still working on the parameters of that. The governor's office had not gotten that uh, those parameters set just yet, and that was the reason why it wasn't in there. Do you uh, agree with that uh, shift to uh, emphasize some of the trade jobs uh, that, uh, that Absolutely. Are apparently are openings? A absolutely. I mean, the, the reality is, is that we have... Uh, we have too many children going to college, and coming out of college which, with huge student debt and no jobs. And yet we've got a lot, we've got thousands of, of, of unfilled positions in the trades and technical areas that, that, that people are waiting to have or, or waiting to take or need to take, need to have those positions filled. So I, I, I agree that's something we need to do. If we want Kentucky to be great, if we want to make Kentucky great again, to coin a phrase, uh, we need to have people uh, filling jobs because that's going to fuel the economy and that will increase revenues to the state. What other bills are you watching? Are you pushing or are you trying to stop before the end of the, uh, the session? <laughs> uh, well, right there's uh, been nearly 1,100 bills and uh, resolutions that have been filed. Uh, there are a number that are working through the system, the P3 legislation that has passed the House. I think is important. Again, that's that's a public-private partnership, uh, much like the the University of Kentucky did in building its new dorms over there. You favor that? That's a yeah, favor yeah. that. Yeah. That's a good piece of legislation that is moving through. Uh, there are some others, uh, a lot of uh, pieces of legislation, but those are the ones that come to mind now. The coal mine uh, safety rules that have come out of the Senate over there, where they're going to not have the state do those inspections at coal mines. Uh, do you? you agree with that? 
I haven't looked at that. It's my, my understanding that that came out of the Senate yesterday with some changes, and I've, had not, I've not had an opportunity to see the exact changes they made on what they actually passed. So it's kind of hard for me to comment on. I understand the philosophy behind it. We've got MSHA, the Federal Mine uh, Safety Organization, that conducts these, these inspections. And there is the argument that the Kentucky version of this is just duplicative. It's unnecessary. Is that government uh, overkill? I don't know the answer to that. But what I would say is that the fact of the matter is, is that unfortunately with this presidential administration, with the Obama administration, with the EPA, they virtually shut down almost every coal mine in the state as it is. They put just about every coal mining company into bankruptcy. There's not going to be as many mines that need to be inspected. I suspect that was factored in, in in their analysis. Less than a minute left. Do you anticipate that there will be a budget, and how do we get there before the end of the session? Uh, I hope there will be a budget. I think the fact that the House Democrats in the budget they pass, and, and I believe it was in direct response to the budget we put forward, chose not to do bonding. Originally, they wanted to bond up to $3.3 billion again uh, to, to uh, throw at, at the pensions and burden our children and grandchildren with. I, in our budget, we, we, we chose not to do that at all, and we were able to fully fund uh, the pensions, this uh, biennium and for the upcoming bienniums. Representative, thank you for coming. We appreciate it very much. Thank you for having me. And we thank you for being with us. We'll be back with a word about next week's Kentucky Newsmakers in a moment. Welcome back to Kentucky Newsmakers. U.S. Senator Mitch McConnell is our scheduled guest next week. We certainly hope you make it a good week ahead. Stay with WKYT for the latest.